Hi, good evening. Um, this is Kelly and I'm here. We're going to be doing an abridged version of chapters three and four of The Secret Garden. So I'm going to get started. Chapter three, Across the Moor. She slept a long time and when she awakened, Mrs. Medlock had brought a lunch basket at one of the stations and they had some chicken and cold beef and bread and butter and some hot tea. The rain seemed to be streaming down more heavily than ever, and everybody in the station wore wet and glistening waterproofs. The guard lighted the lamps in the carriage, and Mrs. Medl Mrs. Medlock cheered up very much over her tea and chicken and beef. She ate a great deal and afterward fell asleep herself, and Mary sat and stared at her and watched her fine bonnet slip on one side until she herself fell asleep once more in the corner of the carriage, lulled by the splashing of the rain against the windows. It was quite dark when she awakened again. The train had stopped at a station and Mrs. Medlock was shaking her. You have had a sleep, she said. It's time to open your eyes. We're at Thwaite Station and we've got a long drive before us. Mary stood up and tried to keep her eyes open while Mrs. Medlock collected her parcels. The little girl did not offer to help her because in India, native servants always picked up or carry things and it seemed quite proper that other people should wait on one. The station was a small one and nobody but themselves seemed to be getting out of the train. The station master spoke to Mrs. Medlock in a rough, good-natured way, pronouncing his words in a queer, broad fashion, which Mary found out afterward was Yorkshire. I see this got back, he said, and this brought the young and with thee. With thee. Aye, that's her, asked, answered Mrs. Medlock, speaking with a Yorkshire accent herself and jerking her head over her shoulder towards Mary. How's that, Mrs.? Well, and now, the carriage is waiting outside for thee. A brougham stood on the road before the little outside platform. Mary saw that it was a smart carriage and that it was a smart footman who helped her in. His long waterproof coat and the waterproof covering of his hat were shining and dripping with rain, as everything was, the burly station master included. When he shut the door, mounted the box with the coachman, and they drove off, the little girl found herself seated in a comfortably cushioned corner, but she was not inclined to go to sleep again. She sat and looked out of the window, curious to see something of the road over which she was being driven to the queer place Mrs. Medlock had spoken of. She was not at all a timid child and she was not exactly frightened, but she felt that there was no knowing what might happen in a house with a hundred rooms nearly all shut up, a house standing on the edge of a moor. What is a moor, she said suddenly to Mrs. Medlock. Look out of the window in about 10 minutes and you'll see, the woman answered. We've got to drive five miles across Missile Moor before we get to the manor. You won't see much because it's a dark night, but you can see something. Mary, Ann, Ann, Mary asked no more questions, but waited in the darkness of her corner, keeping her eyes on the window. The carriage lamps cast rays of light a little distance ahead of them, and she caught glimpses of the things they passed. After they had left the station, they had driven through a tiny village, and she had seen whitewashed cottages and the lights of a public house. Then they had passed a church and a vicarage and a little shop window or so and a cottage with toys and sweets and odd things out for sale. Then they were on the high road and she saw hedges and trees. After that, there seemed nothing different for a long time, or at least it seemed a long time to her. At last, the horses began to go more slowly as if they were climbing uphill and presently there seemed to be no more hedges and no more trees. She could see nothing in fact, but a dense darkness on either side. She leaned forward and pressed her face against the window just as the carriage gave a big jolt. Eh, we're on the moor now for sure enough, said Mrs. Medlock. The carriage lamp shed a, a yellow light on a rough looking road which seemed to be cut through bushes and low growing things which ended in the great expanse of dark apparently spread out before them and around them. A wind was rising and making a singular wild low rushing sound. It's, it's not the sea, is it? Asked Mary, looking round at her companion. No, not it answered Mrs. Medlock, nor it isn't fields or mountains. It's just miles and miles and miles of wild land that nothing grows on but heather and gorse and broom and nothing lives on but wild ponies and sheep. I feel as if it might be the sea, if there were water on it, said Mary. It sounds like the sea just now. That's the wind blowing through the bushes, said Mrs. Medlock. It's a wild, dreary enough place to my mind, though there's, place, though there's plenty that's like it, particularly when heather's in bloom. On and on they drove through the darkness, and though the rain stopped, the wind rushed by and whistled and made strange sounds. The road went up and down, and several times the carriage passed over a little bridge, beneath which water rushed very fast with a great deal of noise. 
Mary felt as if the drive would never come to an end and that the wide bleak moor was a wide expanse of black ocean through which she was passing on a strip of dry land. I don't like it, she said to herself. I don't like it. And she pinched her thin lips more tightly together. The horses were climbing up a hilly piece of road when she first caught sight of a light. Mrs. Medlock saw it as soon as she did and drew a sigh of relief. Hey, I'm glad to see that bit of light twinkling, she exclaimed. It's the light of the lodge window. We shall get a good cup of tea after a bit, at all events. It was after a bit, as she said, when the carriage passed through the park gates, there were still two miles of avenue to drive through, and the trees, which nearly met overhead, made it seem as if they were driving through a long, dark vault. They drove out of the vault into a clear space and stopped before an immensely long and low-built house, which seemed to ramble round a stone court. At first, Mary thought that there were no lights at all in the windows, but as she got out of the carriage, she saw that one room in a corner upstairs showed a dull glow. The entrance door was a huge one made of massive, curiously shaped panels of oak studded with big iron nails and bound with great iron bars. It opened into an enormous hall, which was so dimly lighted that the faces and the portraits on the walls and the figures in the suits of armor made Mary feel that she did not want to look at them. As she stood on the stone floor, she looked a very small, odd little black figure, and she felt as small and lost and odd as she looked. A neat, thin old man stood near the manservant who opened the door for them. You are to take her to her room, he said in a husky voice. He doesn't want to see her. He's going to London in the morning. Very well, Mr. Pitcher, Mrs. Medlock answered. So long as I know what's expected of me, I can manage. What's expected of you, Mrs. Medlock, Mr. Pitcher said is that you make sure he's not disturbed and that he doesn't see what he doesn't want to see. And then Mary Lennox was led up a broad staircase and down a long corridor and up a short flight of stairs and through another corridor and another until a door opened in a wall and she found herself in a room with a fire in it and a, and a supper on the table. Mrs. Medlock said unceremoniously, well, here you are. The room and the next are where you'll live and you must keep to them. Don't you forget it. It was in this way Mistress Mary arrived at Misselthwaite Manor, and she had perhaps never felt quite so contrary in all her life. Chapter Four, Martha. When she opened her eyes in the morning, it was because a young housemaid had come into her room to light the fire and was kneeling on the hearth rug, raking out the cinders noisily. Mary lay and watched her for a few moments and then began to look about the room. She had never seen a room at all like it and thought it curious and gloomy. The walls were covered with tapestry with a forest scene embroidered on it. There were fantastically dressed people under the trees, and in the distance there was a glimpse of the turrets of a castle. There were hunters and horses and dogs and ladies. Mary felt as if she were in the forest with them. Out of a deep window she could see a great climbing stretch of land, which seemed to have no trees on it, and to look rather like an endless, dull, purplish sea. What is that, she said, pointing out of the window. Martha, the young housemaid, who had just risen to her feet, looked and pointed also. That there, she said? Yes. That's the moor, with a good-natured grin. Does the like it? No, answered Mary. I hate it. That's because thou'rt not used to it, Martha said, going back to her hearth. The thinks it's too big and bare now, but thou will like it. Do you? inquired Mary. Ay, that I do, answered Martha, cheerfully polishing away at the grate. I just love it. It's an unbare. It's covered with growing things as smells sweet. It's fair lovely in spring and summer, and when the gorse and broom and heathers and flower, it smells of honey, and there's such a lot of fresh air, and the sky looks so high, and the bees and skylarks make such a nice noise humming and singing. Ah, I wouldn't live away from the moor for anything. Mary listened to her with a grave, puzzled expression. The native servants she had been used to in India were not in the least like this. They were obsequious and servile and did not presume to talk to their masters as if they were their equals. They made salams and called them protectors of the poor and names of that sort. Indian servants were commanded to do things, not asked. It was not the custom to say please and thank you and Mary had always slapped her Aya in the face when she was angry. She wondered a little what this girl would do if one slapped her in the face. She was a round, rosy, good-natured looking creature, but she had a sturdy way which made Mistress Mary wonder if she might not even slap back, if the person who slapped her was only a little girl. You are a strange servant, she said from her pillows, rather haughtily. 
Martha sat up on her heels with her blacking brush in her hand and laughed without seeming the least out of temper. Eh, I know that, she said. If there was ever, if there was a grand missus at Misselthwaite, I should never have been even one of the housemaids. I might have been let to be scullery maid, but I'd never have been let upstairs. I'm too common and talk too much Yorkshire. But this is the funny house for all it's so grand. Seems like there's neither master nor mistress except Mr. Pitcher and Mrs. Medlock. Mr. Craven, he won't be troubled about anything when he's here, and he's nearly always away. Mrs. Medlock gave me the place out of kindness. She told me she could never have done it if Misselthwaite had been like other big houses. Are you going to be my servant, Mary asked, still in her imperious little Indian way? Martha began to rub her grate again. I'm Mrs. Medlock's servant, she said stoutly, and she's Mr. Craven's, but I'm to do the housemaid's work up here and wait on you a bit, but you won't need much waiting on. Who's going to dress me, demanded Mary. Martha sat up on her heels again and stared. She spoke in broad Yorkshire in her amazement. Can I address the son, she said. What do you mean? I don't understand your language, said Mary. Eh, I forgot, Martha said. Mrs. Medlock told me I'd have to be careful or you wouldn't know what I was saying. You, I mean, you can't you put on your own clothes? No, answered Mary quite indignantly. I never did in my life. My A addressed me, of course. Well, said Martha, evidently not in the least aware that she was impudent. It's time that should learn, but cannot begin younger. It'll do thee good to wait on the self a bit. My mother always said she couldn't see why grand people's children didn't turn out fair fools. What with nurses and being washed and dressed and took out to walk as if they was puppies. It's different in India, said Mistress Mary disdainfully. She could scarcely stand this. It's, but Martha was not at all crushed. Uh, I can see it's different, she answered almost sympathetically. <laughs> it's time for thee to get up now, she said. Mrs. Medlock said I was to carry the breakfast and tea and dinner in the room next to this. It's been made into a nursery for thee. I'll help thee on with their clothes if they get out of bed. If the buttons are on the back, they cannot button them up the self. When Mary at last decided to get up, the clothes Martha took were from the wardrobe. From the wardrobe were not the ones she had worn when she arrived the night before with Mrs. Medlock. Those are not mine, she said. Mine are black. She looked the thick white wool coat and dress over and added with cool approval. Those are nicer than mine. These are the ones that must put on, Martha answered. Mr. Craven ordered Mrs. Medlock to get them in London. He said, I won't have a child dressed in black, wandering around like a lost soul, he said. It'd make the place sadder than it is. Put color on her. Mother said she knew what he meant. Mother always knows what a body means. She doesn't hold back. She doesn't hold with black herself. I hate black things, said Mary. The dressing process was one which taught them both something. Martha had buttoned up her little sisters and brothers, but she had never seen a child who stood, stood still and waited for another person to do things for her as if she had neither hands nor feet of her own. Why doesn't that put on their own shoes, she said when Mary quietly held out her foot. My Aya did it, answered Mary, staring. It was the custom. She said that very often. It was the custom. The native servants were always saying it. If one told them to do a thing their ancestors had not done for a thousand years, they gazed at one mildly and said, it is not the custom, and one knew that was the end of the matter. It had not been the custom that Mistress Mary should do anything but stand and allow herself to be dressed like a doll. Before she was ready for breakfast, she began to suspect that her life at Misselthwaite Manor would end by teaching her a number of things quite new to her, such as putting on her own shoes and stockings and picking up things she let fall. If Martha had been a well-trained, fine young lady's maid, she would have been more subservient and respectful and would have known that it was her business to brush hair and button boots and pick up things and lay them away. She was, however, only an untrained Yorkshire rustic who had been brought up in a moorland cottage with a swarm of little brothers and sisters who had never dreamed of doing anything but waiting on themselves and on the younger ones who were either babies in arms or just learning to totter about and tumble over things. If Mary Lennox had been a child who was ready to be amused, she would perhaps have laughed at Martha's readiness to talk, but Mary only listened to her coldly and wondered at her freedom of manner. At first, she was not at all interested, but gradually, as the girl rattled on in her good-tempered, homely way, Mary began to notice what she was saying. Eh, you should see them all, she said. There's 12 of us, and my father only gets 16 shilling a week. 
I can tell you, my mother's put to it to get porridge for them all. They tumble about on the moor and play there all day, and mother says the air of the moor fattens them. She says she believes they eat the grass, same as the wild ponies do. Our Dickon, he's 12 years old, and he's got a young pony he calls his own. Where did he get it? asked Mary. He found it on the moor with its mother when it was a little one, and he began to make friends with it and give it bits of bread and pluck young grass for it. And it got to like him. So it follows him about and it lets him get on its back. Dickens a kind a lad and animals like him. Dickens a kind lad and animals like him. Mary had never possessed an animal pet of her own and had always thought she should like one. So she began to feel a slight interest in Dickon. And as she had never before been interested in anyone by herself, it was the dawning of a healthy sentiment. When she went into the room, which had been made into a nursery for her, she found that it was rather like the one she had slept in. It was not a child's room, but a grown-up person's room with gloomy old pictures on the wall and heavy oak, old oak chairs. A table in the center was set with a good, substantial breakfast, but she had always had a very small appetite, and she looked with something more than indifference at the first plate Martha sat in front of her. I don't want it, she said. That doesn't want the porridge, Martha exclaimed incredulously. No. That doesn't know how good it is. Put a bit of treacle on it or a bit of sugar. I don't want it, repeated Mary. Eh, said Martha, I can't abide to see good victuals go to waste. If our children was at this table, they'd clean a bear in five minutes. Why, said Mary coldly. Why, echoed Martha. Because they scarce ever had their stomachs full in their lives. They're as hungry as young hawks and foxes. I don't know what it is to be hungry, said Mary, with the indifference of ignorance. Martha looked indignant. Well, it would do thee good to try it. I can see that plain enough, she said outspokenly. I have no patience with folks that sits and just stares at good meat and bread. My word, don't I wish Dickon and Phil and Jane and the rest of them had what's here under their pinafores. Why don't you take it to them, suggested Mary. It's not mine, answered Martha stoutly, and this isn't my day out. I get my day out once a month, same as the rest. Then I go home and clean up for mother and give her a day's rest. Mary drank some tea and ate a little toast and some marmalade. You wrap up warm and run out and play you, said Martha. It'll do you good and give you some stomach for your meat. Martha, Mary went to the window. There were gardens and paths and big trees, but everything looked dull and wintry. Out? Why should I go out on a day like this? Well, if it doesn't go out, they'll have to stay in. And what has that got to do? Mary glanced about her. There was nothing to do. When Mrs. Medlock had prepared the nursery, she had not thought of amusement. Perhaps it would be better to go and see what the gardens were like. Who will go with me, she inquired. Martha stared. You'll go by yourself, she answered. You'll have to learn to play like other children does when they haven't got brothers and sisters. Our Dickon goes off on the moor by himself and plays for hours. That's how he made friends with the pony. He's got sheep on the moor that knows him and birds come and eats out of his hand. However little there is to eat, he always saves a bit of his bread to coax his pets. It was really this mention of Dickon which made Mary decide to go out, though she was not aware of it. There would be birds outside, though. There would not be ponies or sheep. They would, be, they would be different from the birds in India, and it might amuse her to look at them. Martha found her coat and hat for her and a pair of stout little boots, and she showed her way downstairs. If they goes round the way, they'll come to the garden, she said, pointing to a gate in a wall of shrubbery. There's lots of flowers in the summertime, but there's nothing blooming now. She seemed to hesitate a second before she added, one of the gardens is locked up. No one has been in it for 10 years. Why, asked Mary in spite of herself. Here was another locked door added to the hundred in the strange house. Mr. Craven had it shut when his wife died so sudden. He won't let no one go inside. It was her garden. He locked the door and dug a hole and buried the key. There's Mrs. Medlock's bell ringing. I must run. After she was gone, Mary turned down the walk, which led to the door in the shrubbery. She could not help thinking about the garden, which no one had been into for 10 years. She wondered what it would look like and whether there were any flowers still alive in it. When she had passed through the shrubbery gate, she found herself in the great gardens with wide lawns and winding walks with clipped borders. There were trees and flower beds and evergreens clipped into strange shapes and a large pool with an old gray fountain in its midst. But the flower beds were bare and wintry and the fountain was not playing. This was not the garden which was shut up. How could a garden be shut up? You could always walk into a garden. She was just thinking this when she saw that at the end of the path she was following, there seemed to be a long wall with ivy growing over it. She was not familiar enough with England to know that she was 
coming upon the kitchen gardens where the vegetables and fruit were growing. She went toward the wall and found that there was a green door in the ivy and that it stood open. This was not the closed garden, evidently, and she could go into it. She went through the door and found that it was a garden with walls all around it and that it was one of several walled gardens which seemed to open one into another. She saw another open green door revealing bushes and pathways between beds containing winter vegetables. Fruit trees were trained flat against the wall and over some of the beds there were glass frames. The place was bare and ugly enough, Mary thought, as she stood and stared about her. It might be nicer in the summer when things were green, but there was nothing pretty about it now. Presently, an old man with a spade over his shoulder walked through the door leading from the second garden. He looked startled when he saw Mary and then touched his cap. He had a surly old face and he did not seem at all pleased to see her. But then she was displeased with his garden and wore her quite contrary expression and certainly did not seem at all pleased to see him. What is this place, she asked. One of the kitchen gardens, he answered. What is that, said Mary, pointing to the other green door. Another of them? shortly. There's another on the side of the wall, and then there's an orchard on the side of that. Can I go in them? asked Mary. If the likes, but there's not to see. Mary made no response. She went down the path and through the second green door. There she found more walls and winter vegetables and glass frames, but in the second wall there was another green door, and it was not open. Perhaps it led into the garden which no one had seen for ten years. As she was not at all a timid child and always did what she wanted to do, Mary went to the green door and turned the handle. She hoped the handle would not open because she wanted to be sure she had found the mysterious garden, but it did open quite easily and she walked through it and found herself in an orchard. There were walls all around it and the trees trained against them and there were bare fruit trees growing in the winter brown grass. There was no green door to be seen anywhere. Mary looked for it and yet when she had entered the upper end of the garden, she had noticed that the wall did not seem to end with the orchard, but to extend beyond it as if in, enclosed a place on the other side. She could see the tops of trees above a wall, and when she stood, she saw a bird with a bright red breast sitting atop the, of one of them, and suddenly he burst into his winter song, almost as if he had caught sight of her and was calling to her. She stopped and listened to him, and somehow his cheerful, friendly little whistle gave her a pleased feeling. Even a disagreeable little girl may be lonely, and the big closed house and Big Bear Moor and Big Bear Gardens had made this one feel as if there was no one left in the world but herself. If she had been an affectionate child who had been used to being loved, she would have broken her heart, but even though she was Miss, Mistress Mary quite contrary, she was desolate, and the bright-breasted little bird brought a look onto her sour little face, which was almost a smile. She listened to him until he flew away. He was not like an Indian bird, and she liked him and wondered if she should ever see him again. Perhaps he lived in the mysterious garden and knew all about it. Perhaps it was because she had nothing whatsoever to do that she thought so much of the deserted garden. She was curious about it and wanted to see what it was like. Why had Mr. Archibald Craven buried the key? If he had liked his wife so much, why did he hate her garden? She wondered if she should ever see him but she knew that if she did, she should not like him, and he would not like her, and that she should only stand and stare at him and say nothing, though she should be wanting dreadfully to ask him why he had done such a queer thing. People never like me, and I never like people, she thought, and I can never, and I never can talk as the Crawford children could. They were always talking and laughing and making noises. She thought of the robin and the way he seemed to sing his song at her, and she remembered the treetop he perched on, and she stopped rather suddenly on the path. I believe that tree was in the secret garden. I feel sure it was, she said. There was a round wall against the place and there was no door. She walked back into the first kitchen garden she had entered and found the old man digging there. She went and stood beside him and watched him a few moments in her cold little way. He took no notice of her. And so at last she spoke to him. I've been into the other garden, she said. There was nothing to prevent thee, he answered crustily. I went into the orchard. There was no dog at the door to bite thee, he answered. There was no door there into the other garden, said Mary. What garden, he said in a rough voice, stopping his digging for a moment. The one on the other side of the wall, answered Mistress Mary. There are trees there. I saw the tops of them. A bird with a red breast was sitting on one of them, and he sang. To her surprise, the surly old weather-beaten face actually changed, changed its expression. 
A slow smile spread over it and the gardener looked quite different. It made her think that it was curious how much nicer a person looked when he smiled. She had not thought of it before. He turned about to the orchard side of the garden and began to whistle a low, soft whistle. She could not understand how such a surly man could make such a coaxing sound. Almost the next moment, a wonderful thing happened. She heard a soft little rushing flight through the air, and it was the bird with the red breast flying to them, and he actually alighted on the big clod of earth quite near to the gardener's foot. Here he is, chuckled the old man, and then he spoke to the bird as if he were speaking to a child. Where is the bin, the cheeky little beggar, he said. I've not seen thee before today. Has the begun the court in this early in the season? Thart too forward. The bird put his tiny head on one side and looked up at him with his soft, bright eye, which was like a black dewdrop. He seemed quite familiar and not the least afraid. He hopped about and pecked the earth briskly, looking for seeds and insects. It actually gave Mary a queer feeling in her heart because he was so pretty and cheerful and seemed like a person. He had a tiny plump body and a delicate beak and slender, delicate legs. Will he always come when you call him? She asked almost in a whisper. Aye, that he will. I've known him ever since he was a fledgling. He come out of the nest in other gardens and when he flew over the wall, he was too weak to fly back for a few days and we got friendly. When he went over the wall again, the rest of the brew was gone and he was lonely and he came back to me. What kind of a birdie is he? Mary asked. Doesn't the know? He's Robin Redbreast. And they're the friendliest, curious birds alive. They're almost friendly as dogs, if you know how to get on with them. Watch him pecking about there and looking round at us now and again. He knows we're talking about him. It was the queerest thing in the world to see the old fellow. He looked at the plump little scarlet waistcoated bird as if he were both proud and fond of him. He's a conceited one, he chuckled. He likes to hear folk talk about him. And curious? Bless me. There never was his like for curiosity and meddling. He's always coming to see what I'm planning. He knows all the things Mr. Craven never troubles himself to find out. He's the head gardener, he is. Robin hopped up busily pecking the soil and now and then stopped and looked at him a little. Mary thought his black dewdrop eyes gazed at her with great curiosity. It really seemed as if he were finding out all about her. The queer feeling in her heart increased. Where do the rest of the brood fly to, she said. There's no knowing. The old ones turn them out of their nests and make them fly and they're scattered before you know it. This one was a knowing one, and he knew he was lonely. Mistress Mary, Mistress Mary went a step nearer to the robin and looked at him very hard. I'm lonely, she said. She had not known before that this was one of the things which made her feel sour and cross. She seemed to find out when the robin looked at her, and she looked at the robin. The old gardener pushed his cat back on his bald head and stared at her a moment. Are that the little wench from India, he asked. Mary nodded. And no wonder they're lonely. They'll be more lonely before this done, he said. He began to dig again, driving a spade dip, deep into the rich black garden soil, while the robin hopped about very busily employed. What is your name, Mary inquired. Ben Weatherstaff, he answered. And then he added with a surly chuckle, I'm lonely myself, except when he's with me. And he jerked his thumb toward the robin. He's the only friend I've got. I have no friends at all, said Mary. I never have. My Aya didn't like me, and I never played with anyone. It's a Yorkshire habit to say what you think with blunt frankness, and old Ben Weatherstaff was a Yorkshire moor man. Thy and me are a good bit alike, he said. We was wove out of the same cloth. We are neither of us good looking, and we're both of us as sour as we look. We've got the same nasty tempers, both of us, I'll warrant. This was plain speaking, and Mary Lennox had never heard the truth about herself in her life. Native servants always salaamed and submitted to you, whatever you did. She had never thought much about her looks, but she wondered if she was as unattractive as Ben Weatherstaff, and she also wondered if she looked as sour as he had looked before the robin came. She actually began to wonder also if she was nasty-tempered. She felt uncomfortable. Suddenly, a clear, rip rippling little sound broke up near her, and she turned round. She was standing a few feet from a young apple tree, and the robin had flown on to one of its branches and had burst out into a scrap of a song. Ben Weatherstaff laughed outright. What did you do that for, Mary asked. He's made up his mind to make friends with thee, replied Ben. Dang me if he hasn't took a fancy to thee. To me, said Mary, and she moved up toward the little tree softly and looked up. Would you make friends with me, she said to the robin, just as if she was speaking to a person. Would you? And she did not say it either in her hard little voice or her 
imperious Indian voice, but in a tone so soft and eager and coaxing that Ben Weatherstaff was as surprised as she had been when she heard him whistle. Why, he cried out, thus said that as nice as, as nice and human as if thou were a real child instead of a sharp old woman. That said it almost like Dickon talks to his wild things on the moor. Do you know Dickon, Mary asked, turning round rather in a hurry. Everyone knows him. Dickens wandering around about everywhere. The very blackberries and heatherbells knows him. I warrant the foxes show him where the cubs lies, and the skylarks doesn't hide the nest from him. Mary would have liked to have asked some more questions. She was almost as curious about Dickon as she was about the deserted garden. But just that moment, the robin, who had ended his song, gave a little shake of his wings, spread them, and flew away. He had made his visit and had other things to do. He has flown over the wall, Mary cried out, watching him. He has flown over into the orchard. He's flown across the other wall into the garden where there's no door. He lives there, said old Ben. He came out of the egg there. If he's courting, he's making up to some, some young madam of a robin that lives amongst the old rose, rose trees there. Rose trees, said Mary. Are there rose trees? Ben Weatherstaff took up his spade again and began to dig. There was ten years ago, he mumbled. I should like to see them, said Mary. Where's the green door? There must be a door somewhere. Ben drove his spade deep and looked as uncompanionable as he had looked when she first saw him. There was 10 years ago, but there isn't now, he said. No door, cried Mary. There must be. None is anyone can find, and none is, is anyone's business. Don't you be a meddlesome wench and poke your nose where it no cause to go. Here, I must go on with my work. Get you gone and play you. I've no more time. And he actually stopped digging, threw his spade over his shoulder, and walked off without even glancing at her or saying goodbye. And that's the end of chapters three and four. So we'll see you next time for more reading. Have a good night.